This is the fourth in a series on the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, for the basic Bible course. The book of Numbers, book number four in the Pentateuch, is called Numbers because a central part of it is about the numbering of the Jews, kind of a census, how many Jews actually came out of Egypt, how many were a part of the wilderness wanderings and the history of that 40 years. It's mostly a history of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness from the time of the Exodus until the time when Israel was ready to cross the border into the Promised Land. By the way, it isn't because it actually took 40 years to travel from Egypt to Israel. You could make the trip on foot in a couple of weeks. Uh, it was because the people of Israel were not ready to go into the Promised Land. When they got there, they didn't have enough faith in God to be able to trust that he was able to do what he said he would do. And so God said, well, I guess you better spend some time out here getting all this sorted out before you go in there and start facing the people who are already settled in that land and who are going to resist your effort to settle in beside them. So um, they spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, learning to trust God, learning who God was, allowing those who didn't have enough faith to believe that God was able to do what he said he would do to die off so that their children and grandchildren would do the job that they themselves didn't have the confidence to do. We're going to take a look at uh, one of the great stories in the book of Numbers. Um, again, Numbers is basically a history, and uh, because it's Bible history, it's mostly stories, and um, there are a lot of them in there, and they're all good to read, and what you want to do as you read them is to look for the point. What is this story trying to teach? In most cases, the Bible stories tell the story without moralizing about what's good or bad. They just kind of leave you to figure out whether that's something good to be imitated or something bad to be avoided. In uh, Numbers chapter 16, the story is told of how the people of Israel were sick and tired of all this wandering around in the wilderness. They were tired of the desert. They were tired of not having good food to eat. They were tired of not having enough water. And they were tired of the whole thing. And so they complained about Moses and they complained about God and said, why did you bring us out here? Something that they were prone to do rather frequently. But um, this time, apparently, God said, okay, look, you want to see what it's like to uh, not have me guiding you and protecting you? All right. And so God withdrew his protection, and um, the result was that uh, they were invaded by a bunch of poisonous snakes. Now, I don't know, you know what kind of snakes they were or anything like that. It simply says that they were fiery serpents, that they had a venomous bite, and people died from the bite. Well, there's certainly plenty of those in the desert of the Middle East, uh, vipers and um, a lot of uh, nasty critters out there. And um, so apparently that's what happened. And uh, a lot of people were being bit by these snakes. They were in the tents. Uh, they were biting the children. They were in their sleeping bags. They were under the table. I mean, they were everywhere. And uh, the people freaked out and they cry cried out to God and said, we're sorry, uh, we are really sorry, uh, we, we, really, we really blew it. And uh, God said through Moses, all right, here's, here's what you need to do. You need to take uh, brass and manufacture a figure of your problem, the snakes in this case, and uh, put that brass snake on a pole. So Moses did that. Uh, he went to God, he interceded, God gave him the directions, he made a brass image of a serpent, and he hung it on a pole in the center of the camp, and he said to the people, if you will go to the pole and look upon the brass serpent, you will be healed of your snake bite. Well, it sounded bizarre to them, just like it does to us. Many of them said, well, you know, how can that do you any good? I mean... Just looking isn't going to help. Um, you know, where's the medicine? Where's the surgery? And Moses said, no, this is God's remedy. If you are bitten by one of these poisonous snakes, make your way to the center of the camp and look at the brass snake hanging on a pole, and you will be healed. And people who believed what Moses said and did it found that um, they were healed. 
but many people apparently wouldn't do it and so they died now this bizarre little story um, has an interesting Christological significance um, Jesus in fact refers to this story in John chapter 3 in his conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus um, listen to the story as it's told in John's Gospel chapter 3 now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with every one born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So notice verse 14. Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now, this is all highly symbolic, of course. You know, uh, Satan, the enemy, the devil, the adversary. He is often referred to in Scripture as a serpent. In fact, he shows up in Genesis as a serpent. And God says uh, in Genesis 3 and verse 15, a text that we looked at a couple of podcasts ago, someone will come who is born of the woman, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. And he speaks this, these words to the serpent. Um, the enemy, Satan, Satan, the adversary, uh, he is the one who, if you want, bites people and causes them to die with the venom of sin that leads ultimately to death. And Jesus comes into the world to save people from the snake bite of Satan and sin. And in order to do this, he has to be raised up on a cross, lifted up on a pole. He, as Paul says, becomes sin, he who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So the idea is that Jesus becomes the antidote to the venomous bite of Satan. He becomes for us the one who bears the sins of the world. And he's lifted up so that everybody that looks to him might have eternal life. Now, how does that work? Well, it isn't the looking so much as it is the faith that leads to the looking. You know, if people say, I'm not looking, I don't believe all that stuff, that's ridiculous. Just give me some anti-venom. No, there's no way that looking at a brass snake can make you well. This is ridiculous then they are going to die. But if, in fact, they trust God and they believe God and they take him at his word and they say, I don't understand it, but God says that this will save me, so I'm headed for the center of the camp where I will look at the brass snake and be saved. And it is that faith in God 
and that confidence that he means it when he, when he says it, and he's going to keep his promises, that leads to salvation and rescue and healing and eternal life. And Jesus clearly finds a great significance in this number 16 story and uses it as uh, an illustration of what his mission in the world is to be as he tries to explain it to Nicodemus on that long ago night in the city of Jerusalem.